Hello, and here we are with the last of our recordings about the American Revolution. I hope everybody's doing really, really well, and I hope you're all um, reviewing the full PowerPoints that are on Blackboard. Let me know if you've got questions about anything from the recordings, anything from those PowerPoints, um, you know, anything that you need some, some clarification or clarity or explanation for, and I will certainly do my best to help bring that into clearer focus. Um, so in our last recordings, we actually talked about the war itself, right? Its beginnings, its progress, its conclusion, um, you know, all those kinds of essential details. But partially because the war is a lot like the Civil War in that it's more complex than often gets treated, and certainly more complex than the common narrative of America. <laughs> yeah, right? We won the revolution, and it was all because Britain was being assholes to us, and, you know, all this stuff. That's not really the reality, right? That's not exactly what was going on, or how, or why. In addition, because the war begins more than a year before independence is actually declared, um, the question then becomes, well, what was the war actually all about, right? What were people fighting over, and what were some of the conversations or explanations before Jefferson and Congress come out with the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776? Those are all essential kinds of things to keep in mind as well. So, the um, sort of general misunderstandings, the general confusions, the general motivations on the part of the colonists. First and foremost, and I mentioned this in an earlier recording um, during the French and Indian War or the um, build-up to the revolution stuff, the initial arguments that the colonists are making center around the belief that Britain's behaviors, especially with regard to some of the laws and taxes that Parliament is passing in the 1760s and into 1770s, are violating the rights of the colonists as British subjects. And that seems completely opposite to what we would expect, right? We would expect that the American cause was all about, well, we deserve to be treated differently and we deserve to be separate because we are a different thing, we are a different group of people. That is not the case, certainly not in the early stages of the war and certainly not in the time of Stamp Act or Townsend duties. The arguments are, we are part of the British Empire, we exist in the same system as people living in England, we deserve to have the same protections, the same liberties, the same guarantees of English law that anybody living in any part of the empire would have. And we believe that we are not being treated equally in those terms, which is a very different thing from the way that the revolution is often sort of represented or portrayed. There is certainly an economic aspect to the American Revolution. On the one hand, there is the reality that England's mercantilist policies do restrict America's ability to trade with other parts of the world. And this, because the Americans are a very commercial people in the 18th century, very active in manufacturing and trade or in agriculture and trade, this is a problem. And so a lot of Americans see Britain's restriction on colonial trade as evidence of this unequal treatment, but also they see this as a limitation on the kind of opportunities and freedoms that this new open continent can offer, right? How dare you restrict our ability to exploit our situation in North America when without you, 
we would be able to take advantage of all of this land, we would be able to take advantage of all of these ports, all of our connections with other parts of the world, and so on. Lots of wealthy Americans, including people like George Washington, almost comically in some cases, get frustrated because they want to be aristocrats in the same vein as the British aristocracy. Well, the only way they can do that is to buy stuff from England, because that's where all the best stuff, that and Paris, where all the best stuff is being made. And so they have to buy stuff from London or uh, Manchester. The problem, though, is they simply can't travel back and forth to buy it when they want it. And there's no internet, there's no way to buy it and have it shipped um, without having an agent, somebody who works on your behalf in these places in England. And people like Washington start to feel that they're getting sent back um, secondhand stuff or stuff that is ill-fitting or is out of fashion. And so they start to see this all as part of this larger, almost conspiracy on the part of the English to keep the Americans as sort of second-class citizens, right? The, the kind of um, red-headed stepchild, well, we're not going to give you the cool stuff, we're not going to, to treat you as equals within the system. And that's really understandable from the British perspective because the colonies are colonies. The whole purpose of a colony is to support the empire, to support the home country. And the British frustration comes sometimes from the fact that the Americans don't seem to recognize that or don't seem to accept that. In 1763, literally just a couple months after the end of the Seven Years' War, Britain says, we're going to draw a line along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains, and no settler, no white settler is able to, um, to create a homestead or to settle beyond that line. All of that space between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River is reserved for Native Americans. This is partially to um, sort of make for easier administration of the Indian question. It's also partially to make a cheaper kind of operating um, budget for the, for the colonial um, side of the British government, right? If you don't have to maintain a, a government presence, a military presence in that area, um, it's way cheaper. But this is restricting the ability for white settlers to, again, exploit and take advantage of all of the land that Britain now possesses as part of its empire in North America. And so this is going to be a topic of dissatisfaction, of bitterness, among a lot of Americans that say, you know, hey, we helped fight for this, we helped to, not willingly, but we helped to pay for the operation of the empire, um, you know, we deserve to be able to settle wherever we want. and there's a good deal of racism involved here too, right? Well, why are you giving this land to savages that aren't going to use it when you should be setting it aside for white people, Christians who are going to take advantage of the land and, and turn it into something productive? So there are a number of different things that Americans are um, sort of complaining about. Certainly the no taxation without representation thing, that's going to be a significant factor too. The British constantly point out, you can't pick and choose what parts of the British system you like and what parts you don't. You're complaining that you don't have representation when it comes to particular laws, especially tax laws, that Parliament is passing, but you don't really raise a peep about not having a say in other matters, right? You are um, rejecting the the British system when it comes to taxes that you don't want to pay, but you're not rejecting the British system or even concerned about the British system um, in other respects. And in fact, you're accepting the benefits of being part of the British Empire when it comes to access to different trading ports and that kind of thing that you would not have unless you were part of Britain. 
there is also a disagreement or misunderstanding when it comes to um, representation in government. For the British, the empire is one thing, right? They argue that everybody in the empire is simultaneously represented by parliament, by all of parliament. Today, in the United States, we vote for individual representatives, we vote for individual senators, we vote for individual um, state senators or state representatives who, who speak on behalf of, in some respects, particular constituencies. I cannot vote for a congressional representative for Toledo. The people of Toledo and its surrounding area has the right to make that decision. By the same token, they don't have any right to vote for who should be speaking on my behalf as somebody that lives in Northeast Ohio. That's direct representation, right? That is, I am picking somebody, even if it's at the state level, choosing a state senator, um, who speaks on behalf of a particular population. For England, not many people in Parliament in the 18th century were elected directly by a particular group of people in a particular place in the country. And so there weren't those separate constituencies. They claimed that Parliament represented the whole empire simultaneously. So when the Americans were complaining that they didn't have representation in Parliament, the English were saying, all of Parliament is your representation. Everybody that's in Parliament speaks on behalf of everybody in the Empire, whether they live in London, or in Philadelphia, or in Barbados, um, or in South Africa. And so this is a point of disagreement and misunderstanding, where the Americans were expecting to have somebody who would live in London and would speak on behalf of the American cause specifically, and the British said, nobody in Parliament does that particularly. Um, and so there are some fundamental kinds of issues and, and disagreements behind a lot of what's going on in the revolutionary period. As I've said um, in a couple different places and in a couple different ways, the American Revolution is also a very theoretical revolution. Um, and this is partially because some of the leaders of the revolution are people like Thomas Jefferson or John Adams or George Mason, people who are, if not part of the Enlightenment, at least very influenced by the Enlightenment. And one of the figures who is um, supremely influential in the way that American political um, leadership approaches the idea of, of the revolution and independence is a guy named John Locke. John Locke is an Englishman who lives and writes decades and decades before the revolution happens. So Locke is not writing, you know what, I think the Americans should blah blah blah. What Locke is doing is just thinking about things. And one of the things that Locke thinks about is society. And there are a number of different people around the same time, roughly. People like Thomas Hobbes and David Hume and um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and people who say, how does society exist and how does it operate? These are known as social contract theorists. Social contract theorists say at some point back in history, people come together and decide to sacrifice some of their individual freedoms because in the state of nature, right, if you're just born in the wilderness, you can do anything you want. Nothing's going to stop you or, or restrict you or oversee you. But at a certain point, that becomes unacceptable because there's nothing to protect your right to property, there's nothing to protect your life, there's nothing to protect your rights to behave, except for the fact that other people a hope not to be punished on their end, right? Vengeance is really the only protection in that case, the threat of vengeance and revenge. Locke says governments are created by people who want protection for their property. Physical property, yes, their houses or their clothing or their farms, 
but property also means life, right? That's the most fundamental property that a person has. That's the most fundamental possession that a person can have, is their life. And Locke says that governments are created to protect property, and that most importantly for the American Revolution, and this is cribbed almost word for word by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, a government that does not protect those essential rights can and should be replaced with one that will do that. And Jefferson actually includes that phrase right at the very beginning of the Declaration. And this is going to be one of the central components of the American Revolution, right? The idea that the Americans are completely justified and in some ways almost obligated to overthrow or replace the government of the British Empire, not in the sense of destroying that government completely, but in the sense of, for the Americans at least, replacing that government with a government that more closely reflects American needs and expectations. So Locke's theory is massively important for the American Revolution. Another figure, um, oftentimes sort of lumped into the Enlightenment, not an American, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine is an Englishman as well, and Paine is writing specifically about the American Revolution. And Paine sort of builds off of some of the things that Locke says, including some of the idea that um, the, the claim to authority that the British government has is not necessarily authentic or accurate, right? In the 18th century, there are a lot of people that say, well, kings are kings because God wants them to be kings. This is divine right monarchy. Um, and the heyday of divine right monarchy was back in the 1600s, but it's still a fairly commonly accepted idea in the 1700s as well. Paine says that's ridiculous. Paine says, if God gave people power, then those people would almost by definition wield that power justly and righteously. Because if God is a loving God, and if God is all-powerful, then God would not tolerate having one of his representatives, or her representatives, let's be fair, um, abusing that power. And as soon as any king or queen abuses power, if that power does come from God, then you're under no obligation to be loyal to that authority anymore. And Paine says, I understand that people out there believe that God's responsible for all this, but if you look at this historically, people in power now are in power because they're part of a family that gained power through force at some point in the past. Whether you want to say that that was the result of God's will, okay, but even so, it is still the result of the use of force to acquire power. So it's not a, a religiously, Christianly justified kind of a thing. It is just the naked use of force to subjugate another group of people. And so you, un you are under no obligation to... Um, maintain your loyalty to a system that is purely based on force. And he also says, and this is a conversation that Americans are starting to have increasingly at the start of the war, um, he says, you know what? Americans are different. Americans have their own um, diet, their own fashion, their own increasingly their own kind of language and, and dialect, um, they are increasingly a different people from the British. And it's absurd to say 
that a government and a people 3,000 miles away has any right to legislate a different group of people, a different culture, a different society, um, 3,000 miles from their, from their seat of government. And Paine is putting all of this together um, into a pamphlet called Common Sense. And Common Sense is released in January of 1776. So right at the um, time when people are beginning to seriously talk about the possibility of independence, right? More than just being a rebellion to, to push Britain towards um, treating the colonies differently, now the conversation is, well, maybe, maybe we should be our own thing. And Paine's common sense is astonishingly successful. Um, within the first three months of its publication, it has sold over 120,000 copies. Now, this is at a time when the population of the colonies is about two and a half million, um, north to south, east to west. And it's at a time when literacy certainly is, is good among the Americans, but it's not close to 100% the way that it is now. Um, and it's also at a time when printing is still relatively expensive, right? It's not cheap to have books. And so Payne's Common Sense sells a half a million copies in the first year, which means that literally one out of every five people in the colonies has a copy of Common Sense. That doesn't even then take into account the number of people in the colonies that can't read. They wouldn't have any reason to have this book. It doesn't take into account the people that cannot afford even the cheap versions of it. But those people, because of the widespread nature of, of the publication in general, they're still being exposed to the ideas because there are so many people out there that have it. Um, and it, in many ways, really helps to put the arguments for independence into more common, more um, accessible format. Now, they are not necessarily logically valid arguments, right? Paine is not a philosopher. Paine is a pamphleteer. So Paine is making arguments that in some cases, yeah, they're perfectly sound arguments. But in other cases, he is making a case. He is taking a position that is not necessarily 100% historically accurate, but he is saying it because it advances his cause and it is convincing to the majority of the American public. Um, and so there's a difference, right, between one and the other. We can't, for instance, we can't take Jefferson at his word that all of the things that he puts in the, in the Declaration of Independence were legitimately actually things that Britain was doing. He is exaggerating and in some cases outright lying about things because he has a case to make. And if he needs to kind of stretch the truth a little bit to get there, then so be it. Payne is kind of doing the same thing. But it certainly is a massively, massively influential document. One of the other people who is significant in the sort of intellectual foundations of the um, revolution, and in this case, especially in the conversations that will lead to the Constitution, is a guy named Montesquieu. <clears throat> Montesquieu. That's, he's not like Elvis or, or you know, um, Beyonce or something like that. This is a little bit different. His full name um, is much longer, but he's French, and so he has a title and all this other stuff. Montesquieu is also writing, kind of like Locke, just in general. He's not writing specifically about the American experience. He's just thinking, you know what, I wonder how governments are established and, and how places decide what government to do and so on and so forth. One of his most famous books is The Spirit of the Laws. It's written in 1748, it's printed in 1748. <clears throat> and Montesquieu says, 
whenever you're trying to um, create a government, what you need to do is you need to look at the country as a whole. You can't just say, well, you know, we live in such and such a place and democracy is what we're going to do. Or we live in such and such a place and we're going to do a monarchy. Montesquieu says it depends on a lot of different factors. For instance, you have to look at the geography. Um, is it a diverse population? Um, what, what kind of religious influences are there? What kinds of traditions is, is this particular population or this particular country inheriting um, or emphasizing? And so he says there's really three different types of government that make sense that can be applied to pretty much any different country. Small countries that are very um, homogeneous and, and very similar with um, easy citizen involvement, those should be republics. And these are going to be fairly rare because you don't have a lot of countries that fit those kinds of criteria and you don't have a lot of countries that culturally and traditionally are really um, you know, well suited to be republics. Much more common would be monarchies. These are middle-sized states. Um, you need to have a fairly forceful ruler. They're kind of diverse, and so you're not going to have people that will agree about things. So you need to have a ruler who has a great deal of individual power, who can just make decisions and make those things happen. Really big states or empires, they should be despotisms, right? These should be um, a government system where you have virtually an all-powerful ruler who can use any method at his disposal to ensure obedience up to and including the use of fear and violence. Montesquieu is not assigning judgment on any of these systems. He says each one of them fits perfectly well and is perfectly acceptable for their particular circumstance. But he says if you look at them in general, sometimes the most effective would be systems that reflect the sort of general structure of England. England, he says, is sort of a model that it has the kinds of checks and balances, separations of powers that will protect some of the rights and, and liberties of the population. And for Montesquieu, a Frenchman, no less, he says England really kind of represents the best um, application of a government system that will secure the population while at the same time being efficient from a political standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. So lots of these, we'll talk about Montesquieu and republics then when we get back into the, the Constitution in the next um, subject. So kind of make sure that you keep that in the back of your mind still. <clears throat> So the revolution certainly is um, quite an achievement, but there are obviously some, obviously and maybe less obviously, some significant failings or limitations. First and foremost is slavery. Um, at the time of the revolution, every single state allows slavery. A couple of them, um, Philad or not Philadelphia, it's not a state, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts will very shortly after the revolution begin the process of emancipation. But um, at the time of the revolution and even leading into the, the time of the Constitutional Convention, <clears throat> all or most states um, allow slavery. And how can you justify a revolution that is, you know, in theory based on universal equality and eliminating ranks and social status and privileges while at the same time allowing slavery to exist? Well, as we'll see again when we talk about the Constitution, there is a practical decision to postpone or delay judgment on slavery 
because you need to have enough unification and enough cooperation among all the states, no matter how many slaves they have, and no matter how important slavery is for their particular um, sort of economic status, you have to maintain some kind of unity to the point of allowing the um, revolution to continue. And so that becomes a practical consideration that eliminates the possibility of moral um, sort of limits or morally grounded limits on slavery. There is also, believe it or not, and again, this sounds a little bit surprising, there is also a very strong anti-democratic impulse among a lot of the founders. There are a lot of founders that simply don't believe that the average person has enough intelligence um, or enough sort of civic mindedness to run or oversee the operation of the country as a traditional democracy would. And in some cases, these founders will make some pretty unflattering kinds of comments about the average person. Um, they'll call them basically in terms that reflect, um, you know, farm animals, right? The common herd of mankind, the grazing multitude, as they worry that if left to their own devices, the average person, the average voter, um, will make decisions entirely out of self-interest and without taking into consideration what's actually needed for the good of society as a whole. And that the people who have that ability would be the wealthy, the people who have education, the people who have money that they can devote to making decisions without being beholden to financial interests, or you know, pecuniary con considerations, um, that kind of thing, right? And so there is definitely an elitist strain, an anti-public, an anti-democracy strain that will sort of bubble along American politics for quite some time, all the way into the 1800s in some respects. And so those are certainly important things to keep in mind as well, right? Because they help to complicate the narrative of the revolution in ways to bring it more in line with historical reality, but a little bit away from the, the common description or common understanding um, that the American Revolution is, is presented as. So that's the end of that section. Um, our next topic, our next adventure will be the Constitutional Convention, because the government that exists well, in theory, exists right now, um, is not the first government that the country creates. The first government that the country creates is known as the Articles of Confederation. Um, and we'll talk about why that doesn't exist right now and how the Constitution is debated, what kinds of things come out of the Constitutional Convention, um, and what that plays forward then for certainly the waning years of the 1700s um, and into the 1800s, and then in some respects all the way down to today. So let me know if you've got any questions about any of that stuff. Um, when we come back again then, like I said, we'll be on a different topic, and I will see everybody soon.